Right now, there's a very concerning trend in sports. Injury rates almost across the board are increasing at unprecedented levels. Knee injuries, in particular, are taking thousands of athletes out of play and jeopardizing their careers. According to the British Journal of Sports Medicine and UCLA Health, knee injuries account for 41% of all sports injuries. Anterior cruciate ligament injuries, ACL specifically, have been increasing at endemic levels. From 2007 to 2022, the average ACL injury rate grew 25.9%. Tiger Woods, Roger Federer, and Kobe Bryant, the three athletes we've studied thus far on the podcast, have all had knee surgeries at some point in their career. Today, I brought in Zach Woodward to talk all about knee health. Zach is a performance coach who has built a career out of helping athletes recover from knee surgery as quickly as possible. His athletes have seen unprecedentedly low re-injury rates. In today's episode, I talk with Zach about why knee injuries are increasing, how athletes can lower risk of knee injury, and his philosophy on how athletes can come back stronger after a surgery. Zach, welcome to the Exponential Athlete Podcast. Thanks for coming, dude. Happy to be here. So first of all, we got connected through a mutual friend. He, he said you were the best guy to know around knee recovery from uh, like personal training and strength, getting back to competitive sports. And I said I had to have you in here because... Basically, every athlete that I've studied to date on the exponential athlete has suffered some kind of knee injury, and they've also suffered a lot of similar injuries now that I've been looking at it. I wanted to get your take on maybe why that is, then look at, at a bigger picture, how they not could have prevented it, but maybe could have mitigated some of these things. And then finally, if someone does get a knee injury, how do we go about recovering from that? So maybe let's kick things off with <laughs> Why, why are knee injuries so prevalent and are they increasing in prevalence, particularly in young athletes or elite athletes? They're definitely increasing across the board from youth to pro. Um, it's knees. It's really everything at this point. We're just seeing injury rates from ankle, hip, knee, shoulder, like across the board. Everything's going up from, like I said, from the youth level to the pro level. Um, doesn't seem to be just knees, but we are seeing particularly ACLs and stuff like that occurrence of that increasing just about every year. And so it's something that is lots of money is going into to try and figure out why that is, what we can do about it, what to do after the fact, but it is definitely something that is a, a rising trend in recent years. And do you think that's just because everyone's trying to get bigger, stronger, and faster, and it's a natural casualty of people becoming stronger and our, our joints not necessarily, or ligaments not necessarily catching up? Or is there something maybe bigger picture associated with that, that change? I definitely think that's a big piece of it, honestly. Um, when it comes to the whole injury prevention side of things or looking at cause, it is complicated because all that stuff's multifactorial. Like humans are complex. It goes all the way into like, what's our sleep look like? Our recovery look like? What's our day-to-day -day look like as well as training? So it's the hard part is that it's hard to kind of point to one thing and be like, this is kind of why these things are happening. But I do think that if we're being honest in the kind of strength and conditioning world, if we kind of look ourselves in the mirror, like I think it's hard not to at least take some accountability for that aspect of it. Like we have guys, if we look at Olympic records and stuff like that across just about every sport, like we're becoming more athletic, more explosive, more powerful than we've been at any other time in human history, just kind of by and large as a, as a group, as a society. And yet injury rates are also going along with that. So it's not enough to say that we're just not strong enough. I think that's a kind of a lazy answer because we're clearly stronger than we've ever been. So whether that is causal, that that just comes with the territory, that as we become more explosive, like we also run the risk of injuries, or whether the actual kind of training we're doing is not preventing, not protecting us to the state that it could be. Um, I think those are all kind of conversations worth worth having and ideas worth exploring. I, I completely agree. And something you'd mentioned was about every every individual person has a unique story, right? They're going to have unique circumstances. Something I picked up on from my interview with Andrew Herr, where we're talking about how different supplements or any of these types of things affect people differently. The rates that they affect people differently can, can vary dramatically. I would also say that there is something that like most people should eat whole foods and, and a nutritious diet or something. There's these tenants that, that are consistent across a lot of people. Are there things that are consistent across a lot of people playing sports that are maybe deficiencies in specific areas, maybe like hamstring strength or, uh, or, or something along those lines that might be causing uh, at a bigger picture more injuries to the knee? Is there some stability or something in there that, that people are consistently overlooking because it's just hard to train or it might just not be obvious to a lot of people? For sure. I think from the sport aspect, um, I think 
it's something that you're hearing in conversation a lot now, but the, the early specialization, the hyper um, competitive nature of kind of sports these days is everyone cares more about the, the U9 state championship rather than actual kind of long-term development. So kids are playing less sports. Everything is kind of more competitive, but less active. So we have a less active lifestyle, but everything is kind of hyper competitive, hyper specialized from a very young age. From a training standpoint, kind of to your point of what you mentioned earlier of everything is really focused on power, explosiveness. We have this kind of Olympic weightlifting, powerlifting, bodybuilding kind of background that a lot of kind of modern day SNC strength and conditioning has been pulled from. And so to that point with the Olympians is we're becoming better being more kind of explosive and more powerful and everything like that. But we are maybe missing some of those underpinning pieces to allow us to have that stability, strength, durability, resilience, and things like that. So I think we've been hyper-focused on this one specific outcome with our training, and we're becoming very, very good at developing, at achieving that outcome without maybe or maybe ignoring some of the kind of ramifications of that and kind of how to mitigate some of those kind of negative side effects that can go with some of that training. It seems like that's also a trend changing and prevailing wisdom is that flexibility and strength can't be, that uh, like, can't be mixed together. I mean, it seems like, especially with stuff at ATG, I mean, knees over toes guy, it's that the more flexible you are, the more you can actually utilize your strength effectively. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? hundred percent. I mean, I think the, just that has been a prevailing thing. It's becoming less and less, but that, that flexibility was bad. And part of that comes down to, there was that term around like tendon stiffness and stuff like that, which is essentially your ability to kind of handle or reproduce force. So if you jump off of a box and land on the floor, the force of that landing, how much can we kind of capture and utilize that to jump back up to to spring ourselves back up. Um, but so we've used that term and then come to mean that any form of stretching flexibility and stuff like that is going to be negative or detrimental. And there've been some, a very small handful of kind of poorly designed studies that have looked at kind of stretching and how that reduces force production. And so that has been extrapolated to mean that any form of stretching flexibility or anything like that is going to be negative and going to be a hindrance to your performance. And I think it's, if we just kind of stake take a step back and look at even just some of like world-class athletes and stuff like that, dancers, gymnasts, martial artists, like all of these people that display world-class power, skill, coordination, and also high levels of flexibility. I think it's pretty easy to to assume even in like Olympic weightlifting, if you look at like kind of Chinese weightlifters and stuff like that, they display remarkable flexibility and they're some of the most strong, powerful kind of athletes on the planet. And so I think if we kind of just take a step back and use a little bit of common sense, honestly, that it's something that's going to give us more options from a movement perspective. And as long as we're also kind of building strength and mobility together, we're getting strong in the ranges that we're opening up and gaining access to, that it's something that's only going to enhance rather than hinder performance. I, I like that so much. I, th I think if you look at a, a movement like clean or something along those lines, flexibility is a very important part of that. If you have like inflexibilities in your shoulder, you're not going to be able to move as much weight. It, it just the, the mechanics are going to break down. Um, related to that, are there maybe diagnostics, like a couple exercises or um, like not, not necessarily stretches, but, but tools that you can use to measure someone's stability or someone's strength around certain muscles in their knees that might be a good indicator of, hey, you, you might be at higher risk for injuries in the future. I know we do some stuff like that with ankle stability and balance and appropriate exceptions with our eyes closed, but is there anything maybe more knee specific that the uh, muscles around that area you're looking to evaluate? So with that, I'm, I'm particularly a big fan of the, like the deep squat of something where we're really getting kind of like astagrass, like really getting that full bend, that full closure of the knee. Um, and whether that's something that you can do just barefoot, amazing. If that's something that you do on a slant board, awesome. Like this is why Olympic weightlifting shoes were invented. Like they literally have a slant in them in order to be able to get that little bit extra range of motion. And to your point about the clean and the snatch, like where we're catching all of these weights is extremely, extremely high load in the absolute rock bottom of a squat. And so in that field, that's a prerequisite, or that's just a common kind of movement or position to be able to get into and to be able to load. But in pretty much other fields, we haven't seen that carryover. In strength and conditioning, almost everything is, especially when we start going down the rabbit hole of sports specificity, everything is that kind of partial quarter squat where we're just, again, interested in CNS recruitment and power and everything like that. And it's something that we don't see a lot in just general fitness. We don't see a lot in collegiate 
weight rooms and strength and conditioning settings. So I think that's a good place to start to evaluate. Can we just get into that position period? Because a lot of people, especially if they have little knee issues, like just that position of a deep squat on a slant board or in weightlifting shoes is going to scare them a little bit. Like, Ooh, I don't know if I could do that. So just to get access and then can we get strong in that position? Can we start to build strength there? Um, I don't think there's one kind of catch all in terms of for any joint or any body part, but I think that's a pretty good place to start. Are there any other ones? Like if you had a list, you're like, okay, if someone comes in and they can't do these three or four things, then we'll start working on a protocol. Or is it more like that's like a pretty good benchmark? Um, or is there some diversity to that? There's definitely a little bit of diversity with the knee specifically. Um, if they can come in and they can deep squat with good form, good load, um, add a little bit of weight with that, then I'm can be fairly confident that they're going to have some of these other places covered as well. Um, again, if we're looking at the knees, I really like the the Nordic hamstring curl as well, because that's one that's really going to have a big impact on the backside, but also the ACL. Um, some step up variations can be good to evaluate kind of where they're at in terms of um, that patella tendon that can be one that can flare up that patella for some people. So if that's something that is they can do kind of comfortably and for reps, again, that can give us a little bit of an idea. The lower we go um, away from the hip, the more we're going to see an increase in kind of the size and strength of tendons and decrease in muscles. So if we look at the ankle, not a lot of big muscles, a lot of big tendons. If we look at the hip and the glute, kind of the opposite, very small tendons, large kind of muscle mass. And so we'll kind of shift a little bit our area of focus. The ankles is I want to evaluate from a elastic standpoint, our ability to jump, recoil, and that sort of thing. So some basic calf and tib strengthening are good for a base level, but then I want to see, can we jump? Can we run? Can we land? Um, that's going to tell me a lot about the ankle and then kind of working our way up into our hip. We're going to look at more kind of muscular stuff. Amazing. And this, this might be a very loaded question because there's a lot of moving parts involved, but you talked about the ankle um, like the, the type of I guess, strength that you'd want there. Um, a lot of the athletes I've studied who had knee injuries, technically all of them also had back injuries or, or, or back pain throughout their entire life. Um, Kobe famously, obviously also tore his Achilles. What's the relationship between that entire chain? Maybe starting with the hamstring, uh, because at least when I tore all my ligaments, the first thing we were doing is strengthening hamstrings and quads. So I would actually start with the foot ankle, just because that's going to be kind of the base, the foundation of if we think about it like a house, not that that's a good analogy, but like if that's the the very first thing, that's the piece that's going to be contacting the floor. So if there's dysfunction there from a movement standpoint, from a strength standpoint, from a previous injury standpoint, whatever it is, that's going to affect everything kind of up the chain. So we tend to, everything is connected and will affect itself kind of top and bottom, but especially from the bottom up. So the foot's going to affect everything on top of it, the knee on top of it, the hip on top of it. So I would look at the kind of the foot and ankle first with all of those. Do they have good strength? Do they have access to pronation, supination? Can it move all of those good things? And then that would be a good kind of measuring stick for me. So I like to look when it comes to injury stuff, kind of acute and then broad. So if they've got issues with the back, we'll look at the back first, see, can they move through there? Do they have any kind of dysfunction, any um, imbalances between sides? Can they demonstrate some strength there? Then, okay, we've, that actual place looks good. Then can we start to expand and see what other areas may be affecting that as well? And so that's where I would kind of start local for the back specifically. And then the next place I would look would probably be that hip, that foot and ankle or that hip. Okay. And that makes sense. And if there's an imbalance, which would likely happen because you have an injury in one appendage, that could start leading up that chain of command and, and causing compensation issues. Yeah. And especially for the athletes that you've looked at for Tiger and Federer, you also got to think the the sport that they play is also extremely asymmetrical. Um, and so not that that's necessarily a bad thing, but it is just something to to take into consideration, golf in particular, of your entire career. And somebody like Tiger, who's started from such a young age, he just has a lifetime of just moving this one way. And so the potential impacts that that can have kind of long term as well. Well, I would argue that almost all sports are asymmetric in some sense. To some degree, yeah. yeah. Maybe football would be like lighter on that side if you're a running back. But no, I, I would argue if, even if you're a lineman, you're going in one direction or, or something along those lines. How do you seek to reconcile those? And are those maybe a cause of some of these types of injuries or, or one portion of the cause? Yeah, it's definitely something. It's a, it's a term that's kind of getting overused or kind of abused um, lately, the idea of kind of balance or imbalance or asymmetry and everything like that. Um, and I mean, the body itself is asymmetrical. We've got our heart kind of slightly off to one side, organs, all these different things. Um, but I do think that 
steering towards that center line of bringing us closer towards kind of balance and symmetry, even if it's not necessarily perfect, I think is something that is worthwhile. So for a thrower, a pitcher or something like that, like their throwing arm shoulder is always going to be kind of stronger than their, their non-dominant one. But bringing that a little bit more towards center, bringing up that other side, I do think there's there's value in that. And so I think just understanding that going in um, and then potentially in your training, just having that extra consideration for that. So for the golf example, again, for Tiger, if he's always going to be rotating this one way, can we do maybe just a little bit of extra training the other way just to, again, not completely overwrite that or overdo that, but just to slowly kind of steer us back towards being a little bit more symmetrical? Because I think about things as kind of levels in the sense that we all want to be functional human beings first, then we want to be athletes, then we want to be a golfer or a sports specific athlete, whatever that is. And so always coming back to the kind of the ground floor first, making sure that if there's an issue with the golfer is, are we okay as an athlete? Are we okay as a human being? And then kind of once we address those big rocks, then starting to get a little bit more kind of sports specific. That makes a ton of sense. And, and something that I find fairly interesting is it's not just strength and sports specifics. I mean, you look at a golf swing, me going left, my rotation is dramatically maybe 20 degrees less than the going right. And I I find that a lot of the time, just like you're describing, we're thinking about strength and not necessarily thinking about the flexibility in that sense as well. Yeah. Not to the sense that you need to start hitting the golf ball with the other side, but just being, being aware of that. And if it starts to become something that's by your own judgment, starts to be getting a little bit out of hand, or if you start to notice issues pop up, then that's maybe where we would start to start to look at that of addressing that a little bit. Amazing. So we talked a little bit about uh, I guess some of the imbalances, some of the issues uh, where people might be a little bit weaker, some of the diagnostics on that side. In terms of, again, not injury prevention, because that's something we usually can't, <laughs> we can't do, but in- injury mitigation, uh, what, what are some of the best practices on that front, especially as it comes to the lower body? I do like first, I kind of want to emphasize that point, because I think that doesn't get get talked about enough, like the injury prevention term is very hot right now. And to that point, I think that is something that doesn't technically exist. Um, Injury kind of mitigation, risk reduction, all of these things I think are much more accurate, maybe not as sexy from a selling point, Um, but kind of just, just understanding that, that that is something that's, that's the direction that we're, we're looking to go. And it's also unfortunately much harder to measure of like, let's say we run through an injury mitigation protocol. Like, how do I know that was successful? Do I have data previously from this team or this group to compare it to, to see kind of befores and afters? Um, Cause that is, it, get, it gets very messy when we start going down that. Um, but again, a little bit of a kind of broad or loaded question. I would start to think about like kind of what kind of demographics and things like that are we talking about? But I would still kind of go back from that bottom up. Like, are they a functional human being first? Are they getting some time outside? Are they eating real food? Are they sleeping? Like all of these things, like just kind of taking care of themselves the way you would take care of like a normal human being. Like if we've got that decently good, then from an athlete perspective, are we running, jumping consistently, doing some sort of kind of weightlifting, that sort of thing? Can we put them in? I'm a huge fan of do multiple sports, especially being uh, younger, younger age groups. Um, I think we should do as much to kind of diversify the movements and the sports that they're exposed to. And then once we start getting into the sport itself, then you can start to get a little bit more specific with the different skills they're working on, what positions, what kind of aspects of their game are lacking. Um, so it's kind of a, a, a vague answer maybe, but it's a little bit of a broad question. That's kind of the, the areas that I would think about first. Too often we try and solve some of these like top tier or some of these issues that are maybe affecting the bottom piece with some of the like, working at the top of the pyramid of you're sleeping like crap, you're eating like crap and you feel terrible like when you're playing and we're trying to, whatever it is, make you faster, make you fitter and everything like that without addressing this kind of bottom level. So I think that's something that's, it's the less sexy stuff. Like everyone knows I need to sleep better. I need to kind of eat better, all of these different things, but it's the stuff that actually matters and the ones that play at the highest level for the longest amount of time. Like you can see they're the ones that pay the most attention to that and do that the most consistently because it is the stuff that moves the needle and allows you to not only perform at a high level, but perform at a high level for an extended period of time, which ideally is what everybody wants to be doing. Well, I I can't stress what you just described enough. I mean, there's a great clip from, I think it was Dr. Matthew Walker, who he wrote Why We Sleep. Yeah. And he was talking at a conference. I put it in the Federer episode. But basically, 
poor sleep quality in athletes, it leads to a dramatic increase in the probability of injury. Something pretty obvious. I believe I've seen some research related to hydration and injury as well. Um, but a lot of people would think, oh, if I just take care of my body, you, you, don't, you, you think about the fuel you put in your car, but you don't necessarily think about how you're, you're fueling yourself. And not just from a food perspective. There's, I, I consider sleep a form of fuel. I consider any hydration and, um, and not just drinking water, but like proper electrolytes and things along those lines, uh, a form of hydration as well. Something I also really love that you said was about the range and, and playing multiple different sports. There's pretty good science from what I understand that learning multiple sports doesn't necessarily purely help you in skill acquisition in another. You know, Roger Federer playing uh, pickleball probably won't help him play tennis better. There's the sport specific aspect to it, but that doesn't take into consideration the, uh, the injury prevention side of it. It's moving in different ways, being able to understand how your body is reacting on, on different surfaces or whatever it might be. I think there's a tremendous benefit to that. And with that, sorry, I just want to jump in there. Like I do think it's not direct carryover, but I think about it as it expands expands your kind of potential. Like if we think about those layers again, as like kind of the base of the pyramid. If we're doing multiple sports, getting exposed to multiple stimuli and everything like that, we're expanding that athlete bucket, which means just the wider that goes, we have greater potential for the, the sport specificity side. So not that that's going to directly impact his ability to play tennis, but I do think it gives him more potential to get better and pick up things quicker when he's going back to picking up the racket or whatever that is. I agree. And there's also that meta skill of, of learning that you described is, oh, if I can pick up this movement, maybe I can just pick up another movement pattern uh, easier than other people. I, I've seen that in myself and playing golf, you know, you, you sit in front of a you watch so much video of your golf swing mm. when you're in college, when you're trying to play professionally. The the first time you're recorded doing something, you almost are in awe. You're like, that's not me. That's not what I look like. And then over time, your perception matches reality. But that understanding of where your body is in space actually can transfer into other activities that you do. I'm, I would argue that I'm probably dramatically better than the average person at knowing where, like, if I were to do any movement, I could probably, my mental image of what that looks like is probably closer to, to that, to what it actually is than the average person, maybe not the average athlete, but, but, you know, it's interesting to think about. And, you know, Roger's coach has also paid good attention to that. He was playing soccer in practice. He's playing racquetball. He's doing all these other things kind of because he was like very difficult for him to focus. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and that's what kept him stimulating, but that's part of the, part of the training and part of the total package, right? hundred <laughs> percent. So in terms of injury prevention, is there uh, from, from like a coaching side, uh, something that you recommend doing. I mean, obviously the individual athletes are responsible of what our, our body does are responsible for a lot of these things. Is there something about, Hey, like not pushing in certain, certain circumstances where a lot of people do push, uh, or is there something about uh, the philosophy going in that you should be having when you're training versus when you're competing? Yeah. I do think, uh, there's a little bit of nuance here just when we, we talk about like youth all the way to pro. Um, but to come back to some of the ideas that we've talked about, not to kind of just sound repetitive, but I think the lifestyle stuff first. So I really like the consistency with everything that we're doing that aspect of, I'm a big fan of a lot of the things that are becoming more popular now with like getting daily sunlight and stuff like that, getting outside, like just being as much of what you would think a normal human should be. Um, and I know that's harder and harder than ever these days, for like kids in school and stuff like that, with how much everything's like on tech screens, how much of our food is not real food, but really kind of making that a priority kind of first and foremost. Then from the strength training side, some of the stuff, more of what we can do, especially at some of these younger levels, I do think that really having an intent to kind of master your own body weight, I think is extremely, extremely effective. Like you show me a kid that can do that's 14, 15, 16, that can do 10, 12, like really quality chin-ups, full hang, chest to bar, like that's a strong kid. Like he doesn't need to be doing so many of these other things. If we could get him squatting consistently, like all the way down, it's going to do the good things for the joints. We get him doing some calf and tib stuff, working his Nordics, working dips or push-ups, working chin-ups. I think from the, the youth level, I think that's um, really, really important. I think we can tend to be very quick or very eager to put a bar on a kid's back or weight in their hands and stuff like that. And not that it's necessarily bad or hurtful. It's just that I think there's low hanging fruit below that, that we're missing or kind of diminishing returns on that. Um, if you think about like a tube of toothpaste, like 
a, a young kid is really just a kind of full, like brand new, like tube of toothpaste. And we tend to just grab that in the middle and squeeze. And like, you can get this huge return, but over time it then becomes harder and harder to kind of get some of that stuff later on. And so if we can just be a little bit patient, like kind of just go from the back, like kind of understand that this is a long-term process for this kid and kind of build step by step from a strength training perspective, from a sports skill perspective as well, like teaching them the fundamentals, even if that means they're going to lose the basketball game this weekend, but knowing that that's going to help them develop as an athlete. Um, I think that sort of thing, um, being patient, willing to do the basic boring stuff in all aspects, in the sports side of things, in the training side of things, in the lifestyle side of things like that's the stuff that that really makes all the difference um that i think would be where i would kind of order of operations where i would start to look at some of those things i saw so many parallels in kobe's story with what you were describing there so a big thing for him when he was growing up is he'd play in all these different leagues right and in some of the leagues the less competitive ones he's not focusing on winning He's focusing on skill development. He's playing with his left hand. Exactly. And doing the, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's focusing exclusively on uh, the the lower level goal. He's not out there to win the the under uh, you know uh, you know like the under fifteen like recreational basketball yeah. championship. Uh, but something I also saw with both him and Tiger is they were very meticulous with the skills that they learned as they lined up with their body's development. So. While Kobe was working on certain skills, uh, I think like like posting up and and a, a couple different moves, he couldn't physically ex- execute them because he wasn't strong enough. Uh, same with Tiger. Tiger, in a couple books I read, he said that he could not hit a punch shot, like a knockdown eight iron, when he was like in 1997, 1998, when he was you know 1920, because he didn't feel he was strong enough to do that. I go out there, I'm like, I, this is an easy shot. I can knock it down. But Tiger Woods, who is definitely more athletic and stronger than I am uh, at, at that point in time, felt he wasn't strong enough to execute something along those lines. How do you view the maybe progression of skill acquisition based on the level they're at with their foundation? Another example is like, I, I don't know if this knowledge has been debunked, but you wouldn't have kids throw a curveball at a certain age because you're worried about maybe they're not strong enough to handle the rotation of the arm. That that might be debunked as like a myth, but it's the same, I guess, overarching concept. I think from a physical development or like a strength a development both, as like yeah. as a prerequisite to a skill, it's going to depend a lot on the sport itself and the skill. But I do think that kind of just understanding the kind of layers or order of operations of skill development is something that's that's really, really important. I've heard um, Arsene Wenger talk about for, for footballers or soccer players in the prem of it's understanding just kind of basic technical stuff first. Like, can you just physically operate a ball? Like you want to pass from A to B, do you have just the technical skill to do that? And then can we start to work on some of the, the tactical pieces? How do you fit in with the team when this guy's here? How do I move here? And then can we start to work on some of the, the physical attributes, something like that. And so there's an order of operations that if we jump straight to the tactics and you don't have the technical skill in order to execute, then there's going to be that disconnect. And so I think that gets a little bit more into the the sports specificity, the athlete themselves, the age that they're at. But as a whether it's a skill coach, um, I think that falls more into that category than from the kind of strength and conditioning perspective, um, with a few exceptions of percent per perhaps like kind of Tiger's golf shot and that sort of thing. I think most of those things are usually going to be skill dependent rather than necessarily strength dependent. Maybe if we're talking about like judo throws and that different thing, you have to kind of throw the person. But again, I still think that's going to come down to the coach themselves, understanding the the sport and the levels of development needed in order to execute a certain skill and how to progress them through that. I mean, it goes back to the old like martial arts movies and the sensei and stuff like that of like the karate kid of like going through these kind of yeah, stages on, of development on. and like beginning with the end in mind, essentially, like you have to know what the outcome is that we want to get them to. And then what the stages of development are of each of those pieces and where they're at along that. And then you plug them in and they develop this skill and then this skill and this skill, even though they can't understand how skill A connects to skill Z, it's they need to go through each of those levels in order to get to the last one. So where does the intersection of skill acquisition from a coaching perspective and strength and performance, where where do they meet? I mean, is there overlap with with coaches you work with, you know, like the, a kid comes in and let's say he's a tennis player, you know, should you be working with their tennis coach to be on the same page? I mean, we do that in some, at the elite level, you do that in golf. At the elite level, you do that in basketball from what I've seen. But how prevalent is that at maybe like P5 
people who are going to be at the elite level, but they don't have access to those resources necessarily yet. It's a really interesting conversation. And there's a lot of people that have kind of different perspectives on that. There are some that will kind of almost ignore that to a fault of, I'm just going to train the physical attributes. I'm going to get you stronger, fitter, more robust, and then you go and execute your sport however that is that you want to. There's some that take more of a kind of blend of both. Um, I think it depends. There's a lot of factors that go into that. One, like the actual understanding the strength coach has with the sport that they're going to do. If we want to kind of dabble in that, the time that they have available, the interest of the athletes, all that sort of thing. I think some of the areas where you could blend that the most from kind of the sport or the strength coach's perspective is kind of just movement skill and stuff like that. So when you start seeing um, things that are becoming more popular of guys doing different crawling variations, movement games, puzzles, and stuff like that, where they just have to solve some sort of kind of physical problem, whether it's a game that they're playing with a ball and you put different restrictions on there, if they can't use this arm, whatever it is, it's kind of arbitrary, but just getting people to have a higher kind of kinesthetic awareness that you mentioned of earlier, of you feeling like you have a higher just understanding of your body in space compared to the average adult, the average athlete. And I think that's a skill that's trainable. There's people in this space that do a fantastic job of that. Um, coach, I'm going to butcher her name, but um, wrestling prep on Instagram. If you look her stuff up, she's got wrestlers doing these insane, just like flips and calisthenics and just moving in ways that are like unbelievable. And you look at that and like, that's not going to like, I don't know how that translates to wrestling, but that's a skill that you want to have. Like they just look like better athletes. And I think that ability, that's one of the things that we do in here in this facility. We just do it from a track and field, like sprinting perspective of if we get the athlete to run better, to run faster, we're just going to increase their output of their entire CNS, but we're also just going to get them to kind of move better in all other aspects. So I think that's where some of the the bridge and the carryover is. Can we get them to move better, run better in kind of whatever domain that they're going to perform in? It's going to look different for a wrestler than it is for a soccer player and stuff like that. But I think that's where some of the carryover is between those two. Something I've always found very interesting is when you see a person, sometimes you can just tell like how they walk and how they move they're just athletic. It, it it looks natural to them. There's something about it. Is that something people can develop? I, I know that's a very opaque question, Yeah, yeah but yeah. I, I figure you probably have some at least context for, to be able to answer that. I, I think so for sure. Um, I think there there's levels to that, and but I wouldn't be in this field if I didn't think that we could get better at that sort of thing. Um, and whether it's not just the raw strength output piece of lifting more, lifting more weight, running faster and everything like that, but the ability to acquire skills, to move in different ways and everything like that. I think that's, that's absolutely trainable. I think there's a natural element of it as well. Like some guys are just kind of born with that. Um, some have to work a little bit harder at it, but I don't think that's, I mean, dance is a really good example. A lot of people, that's something that's a little bit more like esoteric or people it's either like, yes, no, like it's not really one that people think of like kind of training for and stuff like that. But like, I guarantee you, if you take some just real awkward gangly kid who feels really shy and like you spent 10, 20 hours with him, like actually in a salsa class or whatever it is, like that's something that's less kind of strength and output related and more like you have that kind of athlete swagger and smoothness and fluidity to it. Like, I think that's something that is trainable. We just do less of it. And so we, and so we tend to think about that as something that's less trainable because it's not as common. You're not going to see and like walk into a rate room and see a bunch of football guys doing, you know, taking, um, salsa class, although Kobe tap danced, I know, but yeah. like, I think there, there's an element of that as well. Like everyone, there is going to be the, the natural aspect of guys that just are born with it, but I don't think that's something that can't be developed either. Yeah. You also have Lomachenko, I believe oh, uh, with Loma. the, I, I, it was Bel Belay, correct? Yeah. That he, yeah. that his dad made him do just yeah. take a year off boxing. Exactly. And you and look forward. at, and he's one of the best of, movers in like the sport of boxing, like in terms of footwork and everything like that. Like he just, it, the way he moves is mind boggling. And yeah, it's hard to think that there's not crossover to that. He's probably one of my favorite boxers to watch. hundred percent. Um, so we've talked a little bit about why injuries happen a little bit about mitigation and, and some of the things that you look for to be able to push athletes in the right direction to make them feel more coordinated. A lot of these things I want to touch on what happens if someone gets injured. But first, I want to learn a little bit more about your story. So how did you 
first get into this space? You know, what what is the thing that that got you interested in in injury recovery to begin with? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like like a lot of kind of coaches in this space, like got into this is the the failed athlete story of those that can't do teach. <laughs> um, but no, I I actually broke my ankle going into my freshman year of college. So right after I'd committed to go play soccer in college, broke my ankle, had surgery the day after my 18th birthday, all of that fun stuff. And my rehab recovery process was a bit of a roller coaster. Um, it was kind of like two parts almost. I did rehab at the Orthopedic Institute at the University of Florida all summer. It was phenomenal. Everything went really, really well. It was training hard. Everything was ahead of schedule. Ahead of schedule got cleared two days before I went to preseason, jumped straight into preseason. I'm like, I'm good to go. Two days in, heard it again. And so then that kind of second time around, like the recovery was a lot less structured, organized, had good days, bad days, um, and kind of was, was a very challenging, like mental as well as physical process and ended up being about two years before I really kind of felt like myself again um, and ended up kind of missing a large part of like my college career because of that. So then got started down that rabbit hole, just like trying to fix myself and everything like that ended up kind of being able to do that and then finding some very cool kind of mentors in this space. Um, ben Patrick, the knees over toes guy being one of those um, kind of before he got big on social media and everything like that. And hearing his story, seeing the stuff that he did, getting to kind of train with him and the the people in his gym in person um, really kind of opened my eyes to, I was already in the strength and conditioning space and starting to think that potentially we could be doing things a little bit differently. Um, you walk in most college weight rooms and the best athlete in the weight room is rarely, rarely the best athlete on the field and vice versa. And so I was kind of thinking of if that's the case, like, are we necessarily doing the right things? Are we having that kind of transfer carryover? And so kind of seeing the stuff that he was doing, um, his own story, going from multiple ACLs to being able to dunk, being athletic, earning a college scholarship, everything like that was very compelling. And then applying that with myself, like five years post-college, I was dunking for the first time, running a four, five, four, six after running a five, two, my actual college, as an actual college athlete. So becoming more athletic past when most guys would consider their like prime. Um, and then starting to use this in kind of the rehab space, just trying to help guys essentially. So it kind of got into that a little bit organically of started training guys on my own at a park. And it was literally just whoever would show up. Like when you're first getting started, I had a couple of dumbbells and a sandbag in my local park. And we were kind of running training sessions for whoever wanted to show up. And literally the first client I ever had was a, a kid who had a corrective surgery to fix like a bow leg. So they literally broke his leg moved it, stuck it in a cage with like rods crisscrossing the whole thing and left it like that for, I think it was like six months or something and then took it off. And he comes here, he's like, ah, oh, my knee, my shin hurt. I'm like, no kidding. And so he was the first client I ever had. And it was kind of like just having to figure it out, like just trying to see what would work with him, see what stuff helped, see what stuff didn't feel good. Um, was able to get him feeling a little bit better and then kind of just organically snowballed into, he told the next guy who told the next guy who each one had a little bit worse injury, worse injury until I was- It's hard I, to imagine worse than that. Yeah. But. Well, I mean, I've had a, a skier who had nine knee surgeries between her two knees, um, who we did six months of stuff together and a lot of this kind of training that we're talking about. And she's been back skiing for two and a half, three years, doing all the things that she loves, no issues and everything like that. So it's kind of just organically, um, become a little bit of a niche of mine. It's been very rewarding to help people that have gone through three, four of these kind of rehabs that have gone through all of the specialists, the PTs, the doctors told they're not going to do X, Y, Z again, like, especially when I was first getting started. Those, those are the only people that would come and work with me. So all of the, uh, the problem children, as I kind of jokingly called them and being able to take them from where they were to being in a better place was extremely rewarding. And so doing more and more of that, trying to figure out how to keep doing that better. Um, that's kind of what's how we've gotten here today. So what is maybe the, the main difference between more conventional wisdom and what you're currently working on the stuff that Ben Patrick is doing can you maybe just paint a picture of like this versus that it's probably not that simple yeah but yeah, yeah so for what I do specifically I kind of in the the rehab return to sports space um, I'm not a PT I'm not a physio anything like that I'm a strength coach that's my background I've got a master's degree in kinesiology strength and conditioning cert coached in three different college weight rooms all of that fun stuff but where I operate and what I see is one of the biggest areas that's missing in this space is this kind of gray area between rehab and training most people that go to PT get kind of reduction in symptoms feel pretty good get back on their feet but 
they don't feel like themselves again. They're not an athlete again. They don't know where to go from there. And then most personal trainers, strength coaches, people over here in like the quote performance side, they don't want to reach back and touch that stuff. They don't have the skill set. They don't want to overstep. They don't want to mess people up. And so it's that that gap in between that athletes are falling through left and right. I think that's one of the, re, the reasons that re-injury rates for ACLs are so high, but we get athletes just good enough to be able to hurt themselves again. And so it's there, they get left wondering like, what do I do now? Trying to figure it out on their own, trying to f- go through all of these different people that are kind of promising different things. Um, and so I think that's Having a a foot in both camps is kind of one of the things that I think I do kind of well, what I try and do the most of. And I think that's whether it's communication between the two, whether it's having somebody like me in this space that's going to help bridge that gap. But there's a a huge disconnect there. Um, And I think that's one of the, the main issues, whether it's the PTs needed to have more of a performance skill set understanding to them to be able to push their athletes farther, whether it's the strength coaches and the personal trainers needing to have a little bit more of a skill set and understanding on the rehab return to sports space to be able to reach back and help pull these guys along. Um, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I think if anything, it should probably come more from our space, our side of things, from the personal training, strength and conditioning side of things. But I think those are some of the areas that are kind of sorely lacking in this, in this space, in this industry. And one of the holes that I'm trying to fill. Well, I would argue that the majority of PT services are largely for the elderly. Uh, I would say, I don't have any numbers up, but definitely more than half. I mean, every time I, I mean, I've been in PT on and off for probably the last three years for my knee and my shoulder now, and I'm almost always the youngest person there. I'm almost always the most fit person there. And in like an average sample of my friends, I'm, Definitely not the most fit, right? So it's interesting yeah. to see that, hey, you know, what is the goal of almost all PT based on insurance? It's to get it so that you can live comfortably and pain-free. Yeah. It's not to play sports even. Exactly. And that, and that to me is a very clear example of where the gap is created for exactly what you do. Yeah. And I think if you just know that going in, then okay. But I think that's something that most people don't necessarily realize. They go to PT expecting like they're going to get fixed and they're going to come back out like they were. And that's really not for most of the time. There's exceptions and stuff like that. There's people doing great stuff out there. But by and large, if we look at the industry as a whole, it is much more of the experience you're talking about. It's an insurance-based model where the PTs are very limited in what they're even allowed to do with you. They've got two or three people that they're seeing at a time. Most of the stuff you're doing is on a table. They've got some 15-pound dumbbells in the corner that hardly get used. Like It's not an environment to get somebody back to being an athlete the majority of the time. And even the ones that have a 10 yard strip of turf and like throw some med balls and feel like they're more athletic. They still don't really have the performance training skill set that kind of is required in order to get somebody back to kind of high level stuff. Um, but we just need to know that like, if that's what it is, cool. Like they do a great job of that. Just understanding that that's what it's going to be, but then we need to know what the next step is. And most, uh, most of the time, I think athletes are getting surprised by that. I've like, all right, I've done six months of PT. Uh, my insurance has run out and I'm cleared. Like, what do I do next? And they get some exercises on a piece of paper that they're supposed to do on their own, go strengthen it in the gym, like whatever that means. And that's their like, thanks. See you later. And like, again, that's not even to necessarily like kind of put all the fault or blame on them. Like they're doing the best that they can, the PTs with the model that they've been given. Um, but just understanding that that is kind of the, the state of the union and understanding just where we need to, where we need to go from there is something that I think would, help people a lot, just setting expectations up front of this is what we're going to do. You're going to get here. This is where you need to go next, um, I think would help a lot of people. To me, a huge problem with that, and I've heard this in some of the other interviews that you've done, is that physical therapy or insurance generally uses time as a benchmark rather than any type of tangible progression. We've also talked about just in the last hour or so about the types of exercises, the types of, of benchmarks that we, we might want to see. How do you reconcile those things? Is it just that, hey, we like pick up where they left off? Is there an answer maybe within PT a little bit or, or is it just, hey, like 
you're filling the gap perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me personally, like in the athletes that I work with, it's just trying to meet them where I'm at, where they're at. Um, I've had athletes as early as four or five weeks post-op still in their big kind of cyborg knee brace and we get started and they're doing some stuff in PT as well. And it's a little bit more collaborative and we're hitting the ground early. I've had others that are six, seven months and that's, they're at that point where kind of insurance has run out and they're part of the way there and we're kind of figuring them out figuring out where they're at and moving from there. How about guys that are had surgery four years ago and are just like able to get through their day to day, but aren't quite the same and kind of tired of not feeling like they can run pickup basketball with their friends. So from my end, it's, it's a matter of kind of fitting, meeting them where they're at. Um, I'm in terms of big picture solutions and everything like that. I'm not so, I wouldn't say pessimistic, but I'm not so like, trying to change this entire system and have this kind of radical transformation of like, let's just kind of understand what, what it is and kind of try and figure out our best solutions from there rather than just complaining about how the insurance based model is, um, not doing enough and everything like that. Um, just try and focus on what, what we can do. And so I think just having more, more guys with the kind of skill set experience that I have or just encouraging more guys in my field in order to start to to reach back a little bit more and, and help with that. I think that's where we can have more of an impact. I, I completely agree. I, I think that, you know, something I've realized from just doing this podcast a lot uh, and, and studying a lot of these athletes is that enhanced and like hyper personalization is one of the most important things because I might, as I'm getting older, I might not heal as quick as I used to. I might not heal as quick as the next person. And six months might not be the right timeline for me. It might be eight, it might be four. And being able to adapt to that is what's important. And I think that that's really hard in the current model. But if you have a compliment or a supplement of someone else coming in, that that's what's inevitably going to be the most effective uh, at, at any stretch of the imagination. Um, how much variance do you see in different people's ability to heal or recover from injury? Maybe is that dependent on where they were before the injury, like their level of uh, physical aptitude, or what are the variables that go into that? I'd say that's it's quite extreme, you could say. I think that maybe to start off with, I think that I have the fundamental belief that just about anybody, no matter where you're at right now, how bad things have been, like you have the ability to certainly improve if not like get back to functioning at a high level for you now if you're 55 like functioning at a high level may not being professional sports but functioning at a high level for a 55 year old one to run around and do stuff with their kids so i think that is kind of first and foremost one of my like kind of strongly held beliefs lines in the sand that being said the kind of timeline and route to get there can vary greatly for a lot of people i have a kid right now who's absolute freak in terms of the rate that he's progressing. Like he was two, three months post ACL and I'm having to like rein this kid in. He's like, Hey, I was at football practice today. I'm like, let's not do that. And he's just, Oh, it felt great. And then he comes in and trained and like, all right. And so like, he's like, we're training, we're doing all the things. And he's just for whatever reason, soaking this stuff up remarkably fast. And then I have others that have gone kind of much, much slower. And like we get, they're still progressing, but it's a much more kind of incremental incremental progress or process. Um, and so the source of that, why some progress faster than others is a little bit harder to say. I think uh, there's lots of things that go into it. Um, where they're at before, they're just kind of mental attitude towards how they're approaching everything. Um, there's, there's a tons of things that go into that. But I think the take home or the kind of encouraging part for me is that I've seen people f come from absolute awful places. This girl having 14 years worth of surgeries, the skier that's had her ninth knee surgery. We're talking about trying to prevent double digit surgeries. Like it's, it's wild to go through all of that for the decade and a half that she'd been going through a guy who's coming off his fifth ACL surgery, who's about to go and have a, a squash tournament this weekend, like to get back to, like, I've seen people come from really, really terrible places to get back to really, really fantastic places. And so it's, not something that's going to be necessarily easy, quick, painless, anything like that. But I think that it is possible. And so just having that option, just telling people that, um, I mean, I can't tell you the number of times that I've had a athlete who's come to me who said, my doctor, my PT told me I'd never do this again. I'd never play sports again, whatever, whatever, whatever. And that to me is just from a person of authority to say something that's so 
especially say something so like casually just off the cuff like that, that's going to be so demoralizing. So just defeating of like, Oh, then why am I even going to do this rehab? Why am I going to put any effort or intensity into it? Um, and so I think that's one of the the biggest things that honestly, I wouldn't even say I try and instill in my athletes. Like I think they're starting to just from the results that I've had, people believe that coming in. But I think having that as your kind of North star of as long as we're continuing to improve, regardless of the rate of improvement, we're going to get to where we want to be eventually. So just keep walking the path, keep putting one foot in front of the other, and we can get to where it is that we want to be. Well, that's definitely something I've noticed in medicine is that usually get worst case and they feel better about telling you that because if it does come true, then at least you were warned. For my my most recent knee surgery, well, not knee surgery, knee injury. I mean, tore my LCL pretty bad, like a grade three sprain, about as bad as you can do for that. And I go in and immediately they tell me my ACL is torn. And I, you know, they do the double the little, test. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. well, you know, I did tear my, um, my PCL before. And so that would be, you know, like that might be why it's loose. Um, but I'm like, you know, it, from LCL to like basically guaranteed needing, sur- needing surgery with ACL or some people might, yeah. but my monies are not strong enough or the muscle around them are not strong enough to, to support it without it. But that was like a really hard thing to, to go. And I, I couldn't get an MRI for another two weeks, three weeks. And so that's a little bit of a, a psychological thing where you're like, well, should I not do anything? Will I mess up my meniscus if I walk around too hard? But at the same time, I, I understand that. But I, I think knowing your own body, because I knew my ACL was not torn. I just, you could, you could feel it. I felt like pretty good. And the way it happened, me doing all this research on Reddit and going down rabbit holes is probably not worth it. But, you know, I think that that says something to be able to understand your body and like evaluate how bad things feel also, because what other people are telling you isn't always going to be uh, super representative on, on that front. Um, but part of that, it dives into the psychological side of recovery. What mindset do you think people should have coming in after an injury. Let's let's take someone with a, an, an ACL injury. Maybe they've been doing rehab for three months. What what mindset would you like them to take into your training? Yeah, I mean the simplest answer is like some form of a growth mindset is going to be essential, essentially. Um, and with the focusing on progress rather than outcome or long term outcome, because like you come to me at month three, like. 9 to 12 is standard for for an ACL, sometimes more, sometimes less. But like if we're looking at, at nine months, you're at month three, we've got six months before you're going to be at this place that we want to be. And if you're coming in at month three, like you can probably not even run, or at least not even run well. And so the amounts that you're going to be challenged by things that used to be easy, um, the amount, the, dis- the perceived distance from where it is that you want to be, it's going to seem enormous. So focusing on kind of the, the gap you have between where you are now and where you want to be, like how far that is, just how incompetent you are currently, like that's going to be very demoralizing for most people. But what you can focus on is doing just a little bit more today than you did yesterday. Like literally just that, that incremental impro- improvement. And if you stack those up, day by day, week by week, month by month. Like that's how we're able to get guys progressing. When you look back like, oh, wow, that was kind of fast. Like a month ago, I could barely do this. And now I'm here. But in the moment, in the workouts, like it feels like we've, we literally are step ups and stuff like that. We're progressing guys five reps at a time, like half an inch at a time. Like they're doing just this tiny little step up on a four inch box and their legs shaking. And it's just like, you're in that moment and it feels like you're never going to get to where it is that you want to be. But you do a few more reps than you did yesterday. You go just an inch higher than you did the week before and like before you know it you're able to do just that little bit more and so i think that's that focus on the process is as cliche as it is but just controlling what you can control do everything that's in front of you to the best of your ability and almost let the outcome kind of take care of itself i think would be the the most important thing to hold on to coming into that with that in mind what do you think the role of pain is in that process for the individual so I, I've heard in multiple interviews you've done, you want to be able to do this, all of this pain-free if you can. You shouldn't be pushing past a, a pain threshold. I've always, when I've been doing physical therapy, been very confused what pain is. So there's tightness, there's discomfort, there's a lot of things that I wouldn't necessarily classify as pain, but I never know what that threshold necessarily means. And no one's ever been able to super 
eloquently articulated. <laughs> Do yeah. you want to give it a shot? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because I think that's actually the first place when having that conversation is actually defining that. Because I think that's something that people will use interchangeably for things that don't necessarily mean the same thing. And so when I talk about pain, I'm talking about something that doesn't feel right. Like this sharp stabbing discomfort, I'm making things worse, like this doesn't feel good type sensation associated with like actual damage rather than discomfort. Um, the discomfort is because we all know like exercise sucks. Training hard sucks. It's extremely painful, uncomfortable, whatever it is like that sensation we want as much of as possible because that's going to provide the stimulus that's going to then result in the adaptation of us getting better. I want to minimize that sharp stabbing, what I will call like actual pain versus discomfort. That's the kind of distinction that I will use. Um, and I think most of the time coming back to the sense of understanding your body and everything like that, most of the people know the difference, especially if you define the terms like that ahead of time. Um, and so it's interesting for me, like a lot of people will look at a lot of what I do kind of rehab wise with my athletes and talk about how like aggressive it is or how much more challenging it is than a lot of kind of conventional rehab practices. And yet when it comes to pain specifically, I'm actually much more conservative than just about anybody else in the, in the rehab space. Um, there's different like kind of science on it and people with differing opinions on the actual role of that. And a lot of them will say that a little bit's okay to push through and everything like that. Um, they say a little bit and then ends up usually being a little bit more. Um, but for me, I just find it easiest just to use that as I actually use that as like kind of a guide rail or like a measuring stick If we want to go right up into that point without crossing that line. Um, and so it makes it a very easy place to follow, to understand if I'm overdoing things, if I feel pain during or after, that's usually, usually a good sign. Um, but then also we can flip that of as long as I'm not crossing this, I have the green light to really go after things. And so that piece, I think almost makes it very encouraging for guys that, uh, guy that was five weeks post post ACL um, that I was talking about, like still in his big old brace and stuff like that. Like we got him doing kind of backwards walking retro stuff on a treadmill, calves and tibs. We did like five rounds of that. Absolutely smashed the kid. Like it was just like in a fantastic workout, able to feel like he's actually training again, but nothing did damage to the knee. Felt good during, felt good after, like actually got to feel like he was working again. And so that's one of the things that I think is, encouraging for people getting started with rehab. Another one of the issues besides the whole insurance models that most guys will get two, three, four, five months into rehab. And then it's like, uh, like it's, it's easy. Like it stops becoming a stimulus. Um, and then we stop getting the adaptation as, as a result of that. And so finding ways to challenge people kind of at whatever level that they're at, that is essentially the entire process of what I do in a nutshell. We have specific ways of how we want to do that, but whatever your injury is like ACL, shoulder, ankle, all of these different things, like I want to find where you're at right now, what you're capable of, and just flirt with that line, just slowly expand that envelope until we can do all the things that we did before. Like as simple as it is, that is the entire process of kind of rehab for me. And eventually like that looks like training to me, rehab and training are two sides of the same coin. They're the same thing. It's just a sliding scale of kind of intensity and everything like that. Um, but that's how I approach pain to me, the simple kind of the wrap it back up to what we were talking about, the simple analogy that, that I'll use for guys. Um, and this is a little bit of an oversimplification. People in the medical space might have a more nuanced explanation than me, but if we think about the kind of fundamentals of how working out works, exercise works. We go and we lift weights, we do a bicep curl, we kind of damage the muscle, we chill out, we let it recover and we come back stronger. So we intentionally take one step back in order to take two steps forward. And over time we make progress. Pain, a good way that I like to think about it is that we're essentially doing more damage than we can recover from. We're actually digging ourselves a hole. So we're taking two steps back for only one step forward. We can't recover enough for that stimulus. And so we actually go backwards. And so that analogy, again, it's a little bit more bro science than science science, but I find it to be like, it works for, it works for me. It works for my athletes. It makes it easy to understand. Um, and then the why of we don't want to be smashing through that because you'll see some guys that are very kind of two kinds of athletes when we get into this space of some that are very skittish. And as soon as anything feels tender, uncomfortable, they kind of want to pull back. They don't want to hurt themselves again. And then the other kind that are just stubborn and want to run their heads through a wall and will just push, 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 push until they 
break something for real. And so for that second group, having that analogy, that rule of thumb is a helpful kind of, again, just guide rail of let's just not stop, but let's just steer you over here so that we can stay in the realm of productivity rather than kind of damage discomfort. I like that a lot. Is there, so if we're thinking about the athletes themselves, your role is to help them get to that edge, provide the exercises, make sure it's challenging them in the right way. The athlete's role is to tell you when there is pain or when it's too much. What other role is there for the athlete to do in the circumstance in terms of self-education, in terms of knowing their body, whatever it might be? I mean, what can they do or know to get the most out of their own recovery? The education piece, I try and provide as much as I can um, using more analogies like that one that we're doing, like give, talking about like, I'm personally a big why guy. Some athletes are, some guys don't care at all. They just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Um, but always kind of having that option there for them, whether I'm providing that or they like, hey, why are we doing this? And actually being able to give them, give them an answer. Um, I find that to be a little bit more, like I said, athlete specific. Some guys obsess over that. Kobe was the type. It was like every little detail. I want to know exactly why. I think Tim Grover has talked about the difference between Kobe and Jordan. And Kobe was like, I want to know everything, why we're doing, da, 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 da. And Michael was like, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Um, and so I think that's just that comes down to a personal difference um, between them. The other one, the one that I try and rely on the most and that is potentially the hardest for me as the practitioner is trying to, like you mentioned earlier, get the athlete to kind of connect with their body, to understand what they're doing, to try and feel things. I'm a, I'm big on, especially with some of these smaller movements, especially in the early station, uh, early, um, stages of kind of rehab recovery on feel on sensation on the kinesthetic side of things. Like, how does this feel? What do we feel working? That's a, a big one that I really try and get guys to, to pay attention to and to hone in on. And again, just like with the other piece, some will be more in tune with that than others. Um, but that's one of the, the biggest ones. How did this feel? Was it difficult? What did we feel working? Um, can we improve this? Cause especially when we're looking for those, those tiny margins that tiny little bit of intensity, that tiny little bit of range of motion that we're just trying to stack those incremental wins. A lot of that just comes down to those little details, those little nuances. And so trying to, it's easier when I'm here in person, but to convey that with everything that we're doing, it's just a level of seriousness, a level of attention to detail. And I'm coaching in here half the time I'm on my, on my knee, on my hands and knees, just trying to just move a toe, move and move something, this tiny little degree, just work them just to get that little bit inch of extra range of motion. Um, and that is, I think where we get into a little bit of the, the art as well as the science of coaching, but just trying to find ways to get the most out, get the most out of them, essentially. Um, I think that's what it all kind of comes down to the most. I love that. And it's funny that I've learned more, a ton about knees, a ton about shoulders now, just cause I've, I've had to be interested in the process. I felt the need like Kobe to go, probably too much into the details. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't yeah. know if anyone's ever had the the model of the shoulder or the model of the knee brought to me more in a PT session than, than me. Um, but something you mentioned a little bit earlier, which I, I was kind of drawn to is you have the guys that are really gung ho to dive in. You have people that are a little bit more skittish when coming back to a sport as a former or, or still an athlete, maybe not a, a competitive athlete in the same way anymore. Um, how do you get past the the mental block of competing with a, a a previous injury that you're recovering from or recovered from? I think that that is one of the most challenging things for a lot of guys. Hundred percent, it was for me too. For my like, I was for my ankle. I was physically one hundred percent about a year after, and I didn't feel like myself as an athlete again, as a player, for another year after that. Um, and so that is, that can be a big, big challenge for guys. For me, I think one of the biggest areas that we miss in that sense is we don't treat the return to sport side of things like we do the rehab stuff. With uh, the actual rehab stuff, the work in the gym, it's not like, okay, today we're going to do this huge squat. Like we kind of build up to things piece by piece by piece by piece. So that way, when we're challenging you with sprinting, movement, cutting, change of direction, like you feel comfortable because we've done these 15 things before it, or because it's just a tiny leap more than what we did before. Because again, everything that we're doing is a little bit more than we did last time. So you can make the case that like everything, we have to have that just tiny leap of faith, tiny leap of faith, tiny leap of faith over and over and over again. When it comes to the sports side of things, we tend to ask them to do too much. We go from like, okay, you've done six months, nine months of rehab, like you're cleared. 
go after it. Like, and they're just being like thrown into the deep end. They're trying to like kind of modulate things for themselves, kind of control things for themselves, trying to figure out what's too much, what's too little. And so for me, it's especially for my, my soccer guys, since I have that background, like we'll break down the components of the game the exact same way we do with our rehab stuff. And so we'll just drip feed the return the same way that we do with all of our rehab, everything. So our rehab stuff. So can you go out and do stuff with a ball technically on your own, just move around, get a feel for it. It's like get running, everything like that. Does that feel okay? Can you do stuff with a partner, knocking the ball around, passing back and forth, just some shooting, whatever it is. Can you do stuff in like a, a small group setting? We're not really moving that much. We have them, we call rondos where it's like keep away. Essentially we are just on the outside, just knocking the ball around and we're just slowly kind of introducing more and more. Can we do small sided with, no contact maybe can we do like full games within a team and so that by the time i'm asking them to go put that shirt on and compete it's not as big it's it's not that huge jump because they've done these 15 things before and so i think that's a huge piece of it is just kind of reintroducing that the exact same way that we would anything in a rehab setting with those same rules does this hurt yes no like okay boom then let's try the next thing let's try the next thing and letting them kind of progress at their own pace of like this feels good try the next one ah this feels a little sketchy cool let's come back and try it again next week and then the flip side of that is with the re rehab side of things. I also think part of the reason people feel so skittish to get back into their sport is for all the stuff we just talked about in rehab. Like they're not ready. And so like, you know, like your body knows you're not ready. And so like paper doc says, Hey, nine months, you're cleared. You're good to go. And you're like, yeah, no, I'm not. And like, so your, your, your body knows. And so that's why, like when we've done everything that we need to, from a preparation standpoint, you go out and you're playing and like, okay, yeah, this feels right. And so some of the best feedback that I'll get from, from guys. Oh, like I went and played today and I forgot about my knee or I took this big hit and I got right back up and it, like, it felt fine. Like, I didn't feel anything with my knee. And like, that's the point where we want to get to like a rehab is done when you forget that you've had to rehab it in the first place. And so I think a lot of it comes down to, <laughs> we don't get guys to that point in the rehab process. And so like, you feel like you're not ready because you're not. And so like, you can, you can trust yourself. And so I think it comes from the, the preparation piece. That's where so much of the, the confidence side of things things comes from. I do almost no like mental exercises, visualization, whatever, whatever. Like you can do that if you want to, that's great. But if we prepare you physically and we kind of step by step, like reintroduce the game to you, then by the time you get back to being asked to compete at a high level, it should be like, yeah, cool. Good to go. Like if not, then we have more work to do somewhere along that process. Well, speaking of kind of the, the work to do, Something I find really interesting is confidence comes from the results we've proven to ourselves. So if a doctor says something, you haven't really shown yourself that you can do that. Something that I really loved that Federer did, and I'm interested to get your thoughts on this, is that when he had, when he's coming back from uh, a lot of his back injuries, he has his coaches playing him balls and working him unbelievably hard on the court, harder than he'd work in a match. Because if he can do that, then a normal match he can handle. Same thing with a Michael Phelps, right? When he's coming back after, I think he broke his forearm. I think he injured one of his shoulders. He's trying to swim world record pace in the practice pool. And he's doing it three, four times in a row where he only has to do it once in, in, the, uh, in the actual Olympics or, or whatever competition he's doing. But if he can do it there, even with the injuries, he should be able to do it in this other circumstance where the conditions are technically harder. Yeah, I agree with that 1000%. And I think that's another, probably one of the, the bones to pick that I have with the, the rehab space is like, if we're coming back from an ACL, like 85 to 90 to 95% of our non-injured side, which we also haven't been training that hard for the last six months, is acceptable to then go and return to sport. And so like that concept makes no sense to me. If we, if our previous 100% is a level that we got injured at, especially if that was a non-contact injury, then to me, that should be our minimum threshold, like our baseline that we're looking to exceed. If we want to have any chance of coming back and feeling confident, not re-injuring this, like that's the, the expectation and the, the end goal that I have for all of the athletes that I work with. Um, and so I think that goes hand in hand with what you're talking about. Like that's exactly where I want them to be. I want you to be able to do things things that you couldn't do beforehand. I had guys in here eight months post-surgery hitting lifetime speed PRs on the, on the track. Like you should be able to, to do things physically that you weren't able to do before. If we want to come back and be a different version of ourselves, be able to play return to the sport we had with confidence that this is hopefully going to 
be be a one time thing and not going to fall into that cycle of re-injury. So I, I agree with that a thousand percent. I like that idea of coming back better and otherwise why do it exactly (laughs) exactly well it's because of the attention to it right i mean if you're not really thinking about the things you haven't injured like technically all of you is not injured at a point in time it's really hard to focus on one area of improvement but there's inherently going to be something that's deficient and maybe getting injured in a non-contact injury is actually showing you the deficiency and you can get maybe the greatest returns by working on that because it was maybe what was weakest to begin with probably not with like shaquan barkley or something like that but but with some other people a definitely case the last exercise i'd love to do is maybe get really into the details on a hypothetical situation so let's say you have a soccer player come in uh they they tore their acl in a non non non-contact injury maybe like planting maybe they also have some like minor meniscus damage um and they've been rehabbing for for maybe a month and now they're coming to work with you as well as a PT. So what does that look like, your relationship with them and their PT, if that's like, you know, in a perfect scenario? Uh, maybe what are the first things you're like, hands on the ground? What what exercises are you trying to work with them? Or, or what are you trying to have them feel every day? Just as detailed as possible, just to get a feel for, hey, like, this is what it could be like, or maybe should be like. For sure. So the earlier we get into kind of rehab with people, the more I'm a fan of frequency. Um, I think that's one of the kind of hacks in the early stages when we can't provide a huge stimulus intensity wise because they just aren't prepared for it, that we can get repetition of stimulus with frequency that allows us to kind of circumvent that and to still get get progress. So it's common for guys to go to PT two, three times a week, like in a normal setting, like I like to get guys training five, six times a week. Um, The first things that I'm going to be interested in pursuing the things that I really want to get are range of motion and quad activation. So particularly flexion, extension is usually one of the first things that they'll try and get back. Hopefully by the time they've come to me, they've got that already. Cause like I said, I don't tend to work with guys in the immediate post-op phase. I'll do a little bit of the later stuff. Um, but so I want to get range of motion flexion wise. Can they bend the knee? And then that, that quad activation piece, particularly that kind of inner quad, that VMO, that kind of teardrop, that's the area that you'll see atrophy the most. And so the trick with that bit is, is repetition. I've actually got a post coming out in like two days about that of just the more and more and more and more repetitions we can get with that, the better, because I think something that is maybe not conveyed or people don't quite understand athletes going through that rehab process is that the same way that the muscle tissue will shrink or atrophy, the neurological connection between the brain and the muscle will as well. So they don't understand when we put them on like a backward sled and their injured leg is half the size of their good, of their good leg, but the good leg is the only one they can feel working. Like why, like, why is this? What's going on? It's because the same way that we've lost that muscle tissue, we've lost the ability to actually use it, to get it to contract. And so the way we kind of rewire that connection is with repetitions. And so I think that's one different thing that I'll do in these early stages is things like the step ups or whatever it is. Like I'm a huge fan of high, high rep sets, 20, 30, 50 reps plus 100 reps, depending on the exercise, um, isometrics and frequency. Those three kind of combine to allow us to get a ton, a ton of of reps, just movement, essentially, just to get get that quad to actually work. Because we need that to be able to activate, to be able to then use it, strengthen it, rebuild the actual muscle tissue. And so that's a common thing that I'll even see guys later that come to me later on, four or five, six months will kind of miss is that that real strong kind of activation piece on that side is not quite the same as it is on the other side. And so even though they've been getting kind of quote unquote stronger on whatever exercises they're being tested in in PT, it's not quite the same because they're not loading the same muscles. They're changing the mechanics somehow. So really being strict with how we get them to move with some of these exercises because it's very common they want to kind of cheat and compensate with the hips to get the the task done um and then the the repetitions that we're doing that then with the range of motion piece the deep flexion is what i'm really really interested in and so with that that one is a much slower kind of gentler process so whether it's the deep squats whether it's a deep split squats just trying to get that knee to bend i'm really really big on kind of offloading that stuff actually in the beginning. So we're usually putting plyo boxes or bars where they can do a full, I literally cue them to do a pull up or do a dip on this box. So you can take off as much of your weight as you need to, to feel comfortable, only care about range of motion. And then we're just bending that knee just as far as feels comfortable till we start to feel that kind of like tightness feeling. 
back off, come back. And just slowly working in and out of that range of motion. And you'd be surprised at by being how kind of gentle by not forcing that stuff over the course of a single day, doing three, four, five sets of how much that can open up. And then you repeat that over three, four weeks. And we can really get guys into some good kind of range of motion at a fairly early stage. Um, the floss bands are a little bit of a, a hack or a trick that I'll use with that as well. They're um, these like kind of voodoo floss bands. If you've heard of those at all, you can wrap the whole joint with it really, really snug. And that will help support the joint when we're getting into some of these deeper ranges of motion. So it can help alleviate a little bit of pain if that's there. And it's really, really helpful for improving some of that range of motion. That compression can help squeeze out a little bit of swelling, inflammation. Um, theoretically, it can help kind of with sliding and breaking up some of that scar tissue as well. You take that off, all that blood comes rushing back in. And that's just a little hack that can help with that range of motion piece as well. But those are the first two areas that I'm really, really focused on. Um, and whatever that looks like, the communication with the the PT, however we kind of tackle that together, um, just depends on their schedule and everything like that, what they've got going on. But those are the things that I want to be working on the most and how we're going to try and get them. That makes sense. Is, uh, is that like a use case for manual manipulation as well, where you're working, on range, of, working on range of motion? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Um, eat like the early stages, manual stuff, e-stem, like those aren't tools that I have or use, but yeah, if you've got access to the PT, like those are the areas that I would lean on them for the most. Um, I also, I always tell guys like the, the, earlier you can get in with PT and the more often you can do stuff like they're going to be the most helpful in the early stages for getting swelling down getting range of motion, all of these different things. Um, so especially if people are having that conversation about training with me earlier and we know we've got X amount of visits with based on that insurance model, like use them up as quickly as possible. Cause you're going to get the most out of them in the very beginning when we're six months out and you're supposed to be kind of running and doing strength training and we're just doing balance stuff like less return on investment. So yeah, use them in the very beginning to, to help with that, do the manual stuff, um, in the beginning until we can get some of those, some of those places. I like that very tangible advice, especially if you're coming off one of those, just, Hey, use it up when it's going to be the most useful early yeah. on. Um, what, what are the phases of that recovery? Like, so, uh, you know, I think I heard somewhere there's maybe f five or six phases that you were describing. Um, what does that look like over the progression? So the first phase you're talking about range of motion is really important and the, the teardrop in the quad are their proximal phases to, I assume phase six is them fully competing again. Yep. I have a lot more kind of gray area or sliding scale than kind of like hard lines in the sand in terms of phases. I think about more of kind of attributes that I'm trying to acquire and the, the order that I want to get those in based off of kind of what the body can, can tolerate. And so you can put those kind of in phases if you want to. I also think about kind of categorizing the like short range stuff, like the step ups and that sort of thing. And like the long range stuff where I'm getting that deep range of motion kind of slightly separately. And I'll almost stay one step ahead with the short range stuff as I will like the long range stuff. So in that example, we're talking about high, high, high frequency repetition for this short range stuff, sled step ups, or it's a very small range of motion, just interested in getting that, that quad activation. But I'm just working on accessing range of motion where it's very low load, very, relatively low reps, um, really trying to go slow. Just can we get access to that, that movement? Once we're starting to kind of get access there and whatever our next quote phase is, now I'm going to start to challenge that long range stuff with the higher repetitions. So I can still get that kind of activation piece, but in a, a deeper range of motion. Also the, the high rep stuff does very good things for the joint itself, joints, tendons, and that sort of thing. So now that I've got access to long range, can I challenge that with higher repetitions? The short range stuff at the same time, now I'm probably going to start to challenge that from a strength perspective, um, not necessarily with weight, but usually by starting to increase the elevation. So with the step ups, we're going to go from very short range, maybe on the floor to now we're going to start to increase the elevation a little bit. Um, and just the leverage of that's going to provide a very big strength stimulus, um, quote strength. Like I, I still consider we're doing higher rep stuff like 15, 20 rep ranges. Um, but I still think about that from getting stronger. I know from a like traditional, like textbook perspective, that's strength endurance, max strength is three to five reps, whatever. Um, but we're just trying to get them stronger, more capable of doing stuff. So can we start to increase the elevation on that, um, while I'm getting access here? 
And so that sliding scale, I really like a lot of now what we're trying to pursue the next quality in short range stuff. Now we're maybe trying to load that. Now I'm really trying to make sure is that kind of range of motion posture dialed in for some of that, that longer range stuff. And so that's kind of how I'll start to progress things. Um, and then when we start loading stuff, we can talk about mixing in some of the movement side of things and what movements we're working on as well, but more so than that's kind of how I categorize the phases of development a uh, slightly differently than maybe some of the normal kind of return to sport protocol or like ACL protocols you're going to see on paper. I think that that's probably an overall better approach if you have a bunch of different people and all the protocols are sort of built for the averages. And I, there's a very famous, I think it was like World War II, one of the planes, every cockpit was designed for the average human. And they were wondering why the basically they're having so many errors and malfunctions in the air. And what they found is that while there is an average person, the amount of people who are average within the band that was reasonable was like 20% of people. So you have 80% of the people not fitting to the to the to the protocol or whatever it might be. And so I, I think sliding the band and moving it based on individual recovery, it makes a tremendous amount of sense. And with that, as soon as you miss a stage, like you're screwed. Whether you come in late or things take a little bit longer to develop or whatever it is, like if that's our like, and then we do X and then we do Y and then we do Z, like as soon as you miss one of those, the whole plan kind of go, goes out the window. And so yeah, having that ability to kind of improvise and just assess what attributes, what qualities do they need? And how do I want to train that? How can I stimulate that as much as possible in a way that's going to be well received? Like that's really what we're trying to do. So you have the things you're doing in the gym here. Are there lifestyle things outside of the normal things we talked about with uh, proper hydration, getting good sleep, eating the right things that, that people should be careful of? For example, how they walk around, uh, some of the things related to recreational activities, whatever it might be. Or are there protocols that could help on that front as well? Most of the time, I'm not worried about the recreational activities kind of things because mo most people that are five months off an ACL aren't going to try and jump into like a, a basketball game, except that one kid that I was telling you about. Um, extra things that I love to do, the first place I'll always go is the flossing, the floss bands. Um, that's such big like kind of low hanging fruits, literally a thirty dollar rubber band. The NFL guys in here that are getting ready for their their combine prep. A couple of them that had little knee issues. Like, what can I do to fix that? That's the first place that I'll go because it's something that is low enough stimulus. It's not going to take away from the rest of your training, but it's something that can genuinely move the needle. Like I can't tell you the amount of people who have done that one single time and be like, oh, wow, that feels a little bit better. Like, yeah, then you do that every single day. So I'll have them do that typically within the session. Um, but then as like a separate thing outside of it, you train in the morning, get an extra set of flossing at night. You just wrap the knee, squat with it 30, 40 times, and it does phenomenal things to just kind of enhance everything else that we're doing. Um, another one is actually kind of encouraging people just to to get outside and walk. So I'm a big fan of getting people, even if it's just once a week, like go out to a park, take your shoes off, get your feet in the grass, like get some feet in the grass, like grounding, sunlight, fresh air, like all of these things. Like it's the kind of stuff that's not necessarily as measurable, but like I do genuinely feel kind of makes a, makes a big difference. Um, I'm also a big fan of a, there's a supplement protocol um, that's very, very helpful for this sort of thing. The design for sport is a kind of, a very good company that has this specific thing, but it's essentially high dose vitamin C and collagen uh, mixed together kind of 30 minutes before training does great things for, um, tendon repair and growth. And then you can also take a kind of high dose fish oil as well, just outside of that, to like natural anti-inflammatory. Exactly. Um, and so the, they have one called the athlete stack that literally is all three of those combined in a, a bundle. It doesn't have to come from that brand, but I like that as well. And so with, with collagen, you need vitamin C for it to be bio, bioavailable. It I helps. Understand. Yeah. It just helps with absorption and stuff like that. It just makes it more effective. Um, do, do you recommend like creatine in there? Uh, you definitely well? can. You know, um, those are the first three that I'll go to. So I usually just tell people about that um, unless people are asking for more just because you could end up giving them eight yep. different things. To, yeah, 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 eight different. So the the challenging part, especially like the online stuff is always um, finding the balance between like what's optimal, how much can I give them and how much will they actually do? And so finding that, that sweet spot. So yeah, you can definitely add in uh, a bunch of other things, but those are the 
some of the ones that will move the needle the most. I mean, out of personal curiosity, how is the flossing different than like a compression knee sleeve? So you get more compression from it. Um, you get a little bit of benefits of like BFR. So like we're wrapping this thing like What's BFR again? blood flow restriction. Okay, okay. Um, and so that's something that's becoming much more popular in the early rehab phases. Essentially, you just cut off some of the blood flow um, to the muscle, well, the blood flow that technically that escapes the muscle. So when we're training and we build up lactic acid, it has nowhere to go. So it may, it essentially makes things harder without increasing the load, which is very useful in the rehab place when we want to challenge them, but we can't load them very much. BFR is very useful for that. And so with this, we get some of the benefits of that because um, you do wrap it quite snug. Like you don't leave it on for more than like a minute or two at a time, but you also train with it on. So I'm going to wrap the entire knee nice and tight, and I'm going to either move it around. I'm going to squat. I'm going to do whatever um, until I get, like I usually just go based off of the face that they're making <laughs> until they start making faces um, and then take that off and boom, that's the whole thing. You let all that blood come rushing back in, can clear out any swelling, scar tissue, things like that, but it also just helps provide a, a nice stimulus. But it's something that you're going to use as a training stimulus. You're going to wrap it, move it, take it off. You can do that multiple times, but you're not going to leave it on, walk around with it, anything like that. You're Amazing. Totally one. And for anyone who's listening, I'll link all of these things that he's describing. So you're not just in the dark shooting. Yeah. For yeah, yeah, yeah. Zach, those are all the questions I had. Where can people learn more about your training, learn more about what you're doing, follow along, any of those types of things? Yeah. Uh, Instagram is definitely the best place to find me. It's a Zach Woodward ATP, just Z-A-K. Um, I'm doing a little bit of stuff on YouTube, podcasts here and there and everything like that. You check out his podcast. I've, I've really been enjoying it. I'll, I'll link uh, Instagram and, and podcast in the perfect, description. Perfect. Uh, might have some, um, kind of ACL course coming out before, before too long as well. We can get into some of the nitty gritty of what this actually looks like, but yeah, Instagram's the best place for now. Amazing. Well, I, I've really enjoyed this. I always enjoy interviewing other podcasters. Uh, I find one of the coolest things is that you're a consolidator of information as well. So it's not just your experience. You get to learn from all these other people and, and, incorporate that into everything that you do. So again, this was, this was awesome. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for coming. Yeah, of course. So we have a little bonus content today. So for anyone listening, you can find this bonus content on YouTube or on the Spotify video version of the podcast. In this, Zach is just walking me through the deep squat diagnostic and how he views it and would approach it. All right, so just want to kind of mess around with some stuff. Sure. So the, the one that we were talking about the most was that deep squat. And so whether we're using a slant board, whether you're elevating your heels, you can just put a bumper plate on the floor, just something to elevate your heels. And you can even just go on your toes if you want to. The only purpose of that is just to allow us to get more like range of motion. It just lets us get all the way down here because this position we're interested in. Some people, if you have to squat, can kind of get down there here, but still the leverage and the load is not the same. So a, def a decent could be diagnostic, but then also a training tool is just, can we get into first and foremost, can we just access a position like this? And so really want to see, can we get the knees a little bit forward here? Can we be somewhat vertical? And as far as the elevation, just use as much as you need to in order to get here. It kind of just helps with the ankle mobility piece. So the steeper you go, the easier it is mobility wise to get in there and then press them back out. And so the, just that body weight piece or even loaded a little bit could be somewhat of a diagnostic tool. And then there's lots of kind of tips, tricks for if that doesn't feel super comfortable, how do we get us in there? We can take some of the weight off. We can do some more stuff from a warm up perspective to get the knees feeling okay because we're just throwing you right into this cold right now, which is obviously a little bit more, yeah, a little bit more challenging. Um, but again, that's a diagnostic. It doesn't look good. I think why. But again, that's a diagnostic in and of itself of like a decent test for like an athlete or physical preparedness is how much stuff can you do like quote unquote cold. Like maybe you're not going to be your absolute best from a performance standpoint, but you should be able to roll out of bed or roll into a gym and like be able to open up, open your legs up and run a little bit or lift something like without having to do a 20 minute mobility routine. So it's better shoes on this fine for something like Totally. That. Yeah. I like doing a lot of stuff shoes off, but it doesn't matter to at the end of the world. Sweet. Sweet. Uh -huh. Beautiful. And so that little piece right there playing with the hips, that's a more advanced piece that I really like to get into when we start to strength train this. Cause you'll see lots of people that will start to kind of load this and stuff like that with a bar, but they're a little bit more here. And not that that's necessarily like a bad thing. Like you'll be stronger in that position, but I like to pick on this specifically to really load the knee. So you look super, super comfortable down there, which is fantastic. So I like that full bend because that starts to tell us something about the, the joint itself, more of like the internal structures and everything like that. So 
leg extensions and these different strength tests are fine for telling us where we're at strength wise, but it seems like there's some specific benefit of that deep squat for the actual internal stuff, tendons, ligaments, connective tissue. And so I think one of the reasons that I've been so successful with this rehab st space, why I've had, like, I literally haven't had a single athlete that I've worked with so far, like retear anything, which is, yeah, exactly. Not what, um, not to say it'll never happen, but it's just be, I think one of the reasons is because we're doing stuff like this consistently to actually get the joint itself, the tendons, the ligaments and all that stuff, like stronger, not just the muscle tissue. So we're kind of more durable, stronger from the inside out. And so that's just a basic position that you could look at from an access standpoint. Can we get in there? And then is that something that we could start to load, get stronger in over time as well? So high repetitions to start off with, good for the joint. Then can we start to load that, actually get stronger in there? And that'll do good things from a rehab perspective, also like a performance perspective and stuff like that. So if you're even a healthy athlete, that's something that you could just rotate in of almost all of like, almost everybody just trains here all the time. And so if we just cycle that in some of the different training phases, we just get to have a little bit kind of different stimulus, balance some of that stuff out, everything like that. So that's a, a really easy one um, to get started with. You can offload it with something to hold on to. You can load it with dumbbells or the bar. There's a lot of kind of options and versatility with that one. And I assume there's ranges of, of different. Yeah. That's where like I just use as much elevation as you need to, to be able to get into because it's a lot of people won't be able to get there like you did just mobility wise. So that's where the more we elevate the toes, the easier it is to, or the elevate the heels, and the, the easier it is to get eventually like a flat foot. Almost. Not necessarily. I, I will, I'll even still use that myself because it allows us to get the, the leverage to where we want it to, to where I'm trying to pick on the, just the knees from a strength perspective. And then I, if I recall, like when I was going through one of my AB degrees, that was like, that, I, no chance I could have done that. Exactly. And so, sir, in that situation, that's not something that we're going to throw you into, but having that as a goal is something that we can be able to do. Really good idea. Like, not even just the fact that you're able to do, but just how comfortable you just dropped into that. Like, okay, boom, I'm here. Like, no problem. Obviously, it's not something we're loading, but tells me a lot about how just comfortable, like the internal stuff going on in that knee versus if it was okay, like, yeah, okay, now I'm at like just the, the ease with which we got in there. Definitely. Well, let's say I was somewhere in like this range or whatever it is, so, but it wasn't easy. What's, you know, is that like a, a stretching or a strength protocol or just like a bunch of different stuff to be able to get to that point? or just doing this a lot? Usually doing that. I'll mix in both of those other things and stuff like that, but usually it's just a matter of like actually practicing it like everything else, actually practicing it and then actually training it. With, with flossing for something like that, that no, 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 no. makes accessing it super like much, much friendlier and that it also allows us to train it at a higher intensity without having to load it up.